Uh, I am Howard Franklin. I am the Western U.S. Regional Sales Manager for Leafatech. Uh, Leafatech's been in the uh, rodent control industry for over 75 years now. And today we're going to discuss uh, Norway rats versus roof rats, uh, the differences and the different challenges that come along with controlling these two pests. Uh, you see on the screen my contact information. You are more than welcome to reach out to me uh, by email, by text, or by phone. Uh, there's also lots of other information available at leafatech.com. Uh, we have training information. We have uh, videos. We have uh, uh, literature that's there and available for anyone. So anytime uh, I'm doing a rodent presentation, uh, and this is this is year number seven for me with Leaf Attack, but it's year number 33 in the industry. Um, in any time we've got a, a a CEU version of a of a presentation, uh, states love for us to discuss the commensal rodents, um, and there's three commensal rodents. Uh, you have a house mouse. Uh, which is extremely common and everyone in the pest industry has run into the house mouse. You have the roof rat and you have the Norway rat. But today, and for this presentation, we're going to kind of slide the house mouse aside. And today we're just going to have the two commensal rodents, the roof rat and the Norway rat. So when we talk about the phrase commensal, and you hear that kicked around some. Commensal just basically translates to shares one's table. Uh, these rodents need us and need our food, need our food scraps, need our food production. And they live off of us without returning anything of value to us. Uh, it's it's not symbiotic at all. It is they basically leech off of our existence. Now, of course, in the pest management industry, we do get some value from these rodents, uh, but we get that in the form of of pest control calls and 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 customers. But I always try to emphasize just telling your customer they have rats, that, that isn't enough. Um, customers hire us in the, in the industry for three reasons. I was in the field for 28 years and every thought that I, every, every reason that I've had for a customer calling me falls into one of these three categories. They call us for the ick factor. The ick factor is basically we we deal with things that aren't particularly pleasant, be it roaches or spiders or, or things in a crawl space. Uh, when people see or think about rodents, they, they kind of go, ick. Um, they don't want to deal with, with the dirty things that we deal with. So we get calls for the ick factor. We get calls for the lazy factor. The best example I can give of the lazy factor is I have the tools and the ability and the knowledge to change the oil in my vehicles. I don't do it because about a mile and a half from here, there's a man who has a pit dug in the ground and he has oil right there in handy and he might charge me $10 more, $15 more to just handle it for me. So when it comes to the pest control industry, uh, we've all run into people who, who say, well, I read on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of information available to people. And so we've, we find people who want to find products and want to do things on their own, but they would rather just someone else deal with it. Um, 
And so that's, I categorize that under the lazy factor. Then the third factor is probably the most important one, and that's the knowledge factor. People call us in the pest control industry because they assume that we know more about it than they do. Um, and that we know more professional ways, uh, more proper ways, more legal ways, perhaps, to deal with issues than they do. So we have the ick factor, the lazy factor, and the knowledge factor. I would dare to suggest to you that the way we keep a customer, no matter which one of these categories we got the phone call from, the way we keep a customer long term is always by moving them to the knowledge factor. And that's one of the reasons why you're you're watching these videos today. Um, the more you know, the more abilities you have to retain a customer. So just by saying, well, you have a rat, that's not always enough. When we think about a Norway rat, and Norway rats are, are common all across the United States. Um, if you if you look at this globe, um, that actually, that highlighted area is Norway. It's right up near the North Pole. Norway rat is a terrible name. Uh, the, the biggest reason the name Norway rat uh, came into being is because the, the naturalist that actually named the Norway rat saw the rat coming off of a Norwegian ship. Uh, the rats really had nothing to do with Norway. Uh, the species... Um, just happened to be on that ship that was Norwegian in origin. Uh, the Norway rat is also known as the brown rat, known as the sewer rat, known as a wharf rat. Uh, your customer may call it by any of these names. Uh, sometimes people will call them common rats or street rats. And occasionally, you hear it more in Europe, you'll hear them call Parisian rats. That is a leftover from the era of the Black Plague, where you know Paris lost, by some estimates, as as, as many as twenty percent of their population uh, when the Black Plague hit in the in the fifteenth century. So, um, any of these names is referring to that same rat, the Norway rat. Um, I'm always hesitant to use color. Um, I have seen Norway rats that looked more black. Um, I have, you'll notice there, there's going to be color with the roof rat as well. They call it a black rat. And, and I have seen roof rats that are more brown. So I'm, I'm hesitant with colors. The actual, uh, origins of the Norway rat are China, um, they uh, they were originally found in China, um, and they date back into a, a thousand A.D. So when we look at Norway rats more closely, they are burrowers. Um, that is in their nature. That does not mean you will never find a Norway rat uh, in a location other than a burrow. But as a general rule. They're going to be a burrower, and you'll find their burrows mostly up against protected areas. You'll often find them in tree roots. Uh, you'll find them under the slabs of homes. Um, when, when those slabs are put in, sometimes the, the backfill for the plumbing or, or any underground utility will, will sink, will settle, and... Norway rats will take advantage of that. Uh, often uh, they're in protected areas because Norway rats understand very little, but they understand their place in the food chain. And they're trying really hard not to be eaten. Very much survivors. Uh, Norway rats are predominantly ground dwellers. 
they're the ones you're going to see coming out of yard drains, um, working in sewer lines. Um, very often, uh, if a plumbing clean out is, is off of a residence, um, you will have this random rat show up at a toilet and people don't understand where it comes from. Um, they'll swim the P-trap in a plumbing line if they're able to access the sewer side of the property. They're very hardy survivors. Uh, tons of Norway rats, uh, their pups survive. They have large litters. They're able to survive winters. They're able to survive flooding. Uh, they do an excellent job uh, in in rough situations. Speaking of flooding, they're, they're great, strong swimmers. Uh, there was a, a project actually done with Norway rats on an island, a small archipelago. And um, Norway rats were tracked on that island. And when researchers went back to the island, they realized that uh, some Norway rats had actually swam to the next island over uh, just to expand their their area of, of looking for food. If you look at Norway rats statistically, uh, their bodies are roughly 7 to 10 inches long. Uh, you will always hear people talk about, you know, I saw a Norway rat the size of a cat. Um, that's generally hyperbole. Um, Norway rats will get heavier, but they're not going to be monsters. Most of those pictures that you see are, are optical illusions where the rat is stuck way out in front of someone. Um, their tail, if you take their tail and lay it up on their back, it is, it's going to be shorter, uh, than, than their head and body. It's generally going to hit between their ears. Uh, they, they tend to be a little larger, plumper, uh, their tail's shorter. Their nose tends to be a little stubbier. Um, if you, if you think about them like dogs, they're more like a boxer or a bulldog, whereas a, a roof rat's going to be more like a greyhound or a Labrador, uh, just a, just a stubbier nose. Uh, they're going to weigh somewhere between 10 to 17 ounces. I've seen rats 20, 21 ounces. They're rare. Um, generally, they need to eat about one to two ounces of food a day. Rats will, will go to a location. They will feed. They are not nibblers like mice are where they're constantly testing food and eating some food all day long. Usually rats want to go to a food source and eat. They need about three quarters of an ounce of water a day. <clears throat> In high humidity areas, they can get plenty of water out of their food source. So if humidity in the food is over 20%, uh, they, can, they can get a lot of water uh, out of the food that they're eating. So it's very, very difficult to control uh, Norway rats. Um, by controlling their water sources. Now the big statistics with a, with a Norway rat, um, they reach sexual maturity in two to three months. Once they reach that, uh, they have a, a female will have a 23 day gestation period. Their litters are very large, eight to 12 pups. I've seen a litter of, of 15. Uh, which I've only seen it once. Uh, and I've heard of litters uh, larger. Uh, tend to have all of the pups in the litter tend to survive. And they tend to be able to have that litter four to seven times a year. Uh, you have to keep in mind also with a rodent population with Norway rats um, or with roof rats. There is no DNA testing during this mating. Um, they are uh, very often mating with uh, someone of their own uh, with their own relation. Uh, they uh, 
have no issues at all. Uh, often pups from the same litter are, are mating with one another. So you can you can have a female rodent who is pregnant with a litter, who has just nursed a litter, and was impregnated by two litters before that. So it's you can see where a rodent population can proliferate out of that type of situation. Tend to be a 50-50 male to female. So if you look at what I like to call rat math um, and start dividing up where you end up um, when you have two, two rodents, uh, it can go very large very quickly. Um, this is important when you start thinking about uh, follow-ups. You know, if you if you set up a, a, a place on a ninety-day program, uh, your follow-ups better be uh, very good on those in those first ninety days. If you're doing a 90 day follow up, single follow up, you can have the rodent population out of control before you, you know, if you didn't get it perfect on your first visit, uh, you can very much have a rodent population out of control. So make sure and price your work so that you can put follow ups in to make sure that you're, you're accomplishing the goal that you need. Uh, one of the ready signs of of a Norway rat uh, infestation is going to be droppings. Uh, a, a rodent's going to to mark their trail with droppings. They do that. They don't see very well, so they can see about two feet out in front of them fairly well. So they they leave droppings. They leave urine so they can follow that trail. Um, their droppings tend to be rounder and plump. Uh, you can definitely discern them from, from a roof rat dropping. If you see them side by side, for sure, they're larger than a roof rat's dropping. They're about three quarters of an inch. Uh, a Norway rat tends to have 50 droppings per day. So there's, there's a volume of them. Lots of people like to talk about the color of, of uh, Norway rat droppings. My experience is the color tends to follow the food source. Um, uh, actually, many bait products uh, will, will color the rodent droppings, and that's one way that you know that your, your bait is being accepted. Um, I've been on many job sites where you will find uh, that that true blue green color of first strike soft bait shows up in rodent droppings, and or the green, the very green of, of resolve soft bait shows up, and so you know that your bait's being accepted. Norway rats live everywhere in the United States that there are people, um, and they live on six continents. Um, they've probably been transported to Antarctica at some point. Um, they are, they're extremely prolific only behind the house mouth, um, for, for their spread, um, and for their just sheer population. Uh, they've been really good to the pest control business, but, uh, they've done tons and tons of damage in agriculture and food processing in restaurants, uh, in public spaces, they're, they're prolific for sure. So if we look at the roof rat, the roof rat's a little different. Um, the roof rat, lots of people in the pest industry think that they don't really have to worry about the roof rat. I hear, I hear a lot of people saying, well, we don't have those. Well, the roof rat has a name that fits. Uh, it's very acrobatic. 
it is it it is squirrel like in the way it it travels around uh easily climbs i followed one with a flashlight crawling up the outside of a grain elevator concrete grain elevator and i followed it for approximately 11 stories till the flashlight just couldn't didn't have a strong enough beam to go farther um they're very much often found in higher areas they tend to go to the highest spot they can find uh, their entry point is often in a higher area uh, that's very important for those who do exclusion work or those who are trying to find the source of the problem um, you know roof rat work is is often ladder work and Roof rats are expert hitchhikers. Um, when I grew up in the pest business, uh, I was in the mountains of North Carolina and we did not have roof rats. Uh, as I uh, moved on in the pest control business and later on started a business in Houston, Texas, we were 90 to 95% roof rats on the rodent side. So it was a very steep learning curve um, many years ago now. And it's there. A lot of people think, well, a rat is a rat. Well, they're not. Um, and if you're if you're dealing with roof rats in a traditional way that you would deal with Norway rats, uh, you're setting yourself up for failure and you're putting yourself in a position where um, your customer's not going to be happy. Um, when you look at the roof rat, uh, roof, the roof rat tend to be the more attractive of the, of the rats. Um, they're also known as a black rat, the ship rat, the house rat, or the tree rat. Uh, tree rat is a great name for them because naturally they're found in trees. Um, they, they tend to, to a nest in larger trees, uh, tree, larger trees tend to be their transport to get into a structure and get on the roof line of a structure. Um, they're originally from India and, um, that's, so they're not far away from their, the Norway rats, China based. Most experts think that the roof rat is an older uh, species. And at one point, uh, roof rats were, were all over the United States and they were forced uh, into a more Southern area by uh, Norway rats being so prolific. But that's changing now. Uh, roof rats are moving their way back North very quickly. And we'll look at that a little more in, in greater detail. Roof rats are tree dwellers. Uh, they're very often found in trees um, near structures. I uh, love palm trees. Uh, that picture of a palm tree is actually um, a palm tree that was in my backyard in when I lived in Houston, Texas. And uh, there was a roof rat nesting in the crown of that palm. Uh, but you, we all have customers who, who, for quality of life issues, want larger trees around the residence for shade or for beauty. And those trees can often harbor roof rats. Uh, roof rats are by far the pickiest of the three commensal rodents. Um, that means it, it's, it, it's funny. In the pest control business, many people have stuck with with one product for many, many years and uh, they haven't seen any reasons to change from one product. Uh, palatability can, can really be an issue when you deal with roof rats. It's never really an issue with mice. Mice will, will feed and sample pretty much anything. Norway rats get a little more picky than mice because of that, 
that ability to go and have a meal, basically going to one spot and eating. Roof rats, you you have to have a really really good product, a palatable product to get them to come and consume it. Um, it's one of those places that soft bait makes a huge advantage, um, taking the wax out of the food source. Uh, really works well with roof rats and roof rat populations. Uh, while it's also effective on the other two, um, with roof rats, you've got to be extremely creative. Uh, you will put bait stations in places that you haven't thought about before. Um, when you, when you look at a residence for a roof rat infestation, uh, one of the magic places is, is where two roof lines come together. That shrinkage and expansion that happens during seasons is is the access point, I find, in many cases for a roof rat. But you have to be creative also in large warehouses or in, or in other facilities where you may need to put, you know, bait stations or traps 40 feet off the ground, uh, Often roof rats in a situation like this warehouse will be running the rafters up above the facility itself. You look at a roof rat statistically, it is um, it is somewhat smaller than a than a Norway rat. The body tends to be thin uh, in in relative comparison. Um, the tail is extremely long and it's used as a counterbalance. It's one of the reasons why they're so athletic is they're able to, to, if you look at it on super slow-mo, that tail is constantly moving to help counterbalance the weight of their body. Uh, they'll, they're a little lighter in weight. Uh, they eat less food, of course, um, and less water. And they're mature, they're, they're reproduction, reproduction similar. They have smaller litters. They can have more litters in a year. Um, but they're, the, the issue in controlling roof rats, where in Norway's rats, their reproductive rate can get ahead of you. With roof rats, you tend to kill less of them on the first visit because of their uh, their neophobia, they don't like new devices or new new applications, and their picky pickiness in food source. So, whereas with a Norway rat, you a good a, a good service may kill ninety five percent of the rats on the first visit, and then follow up is just clean up. With roof rats, a good first visit might be seventy five to eighty percent. Roof rat droppings are uh, slender and pointed. They tend to be smaller where the other droppings were three quarters of an inch. These tend to be about a half. Uh, similar 50 droppings per day. Uh, and they also take on the coloring of food. When these droppings are side by side, you can, you can see a, an obvious difference. Um, and of course, droppings are always a key when you're when you're trying to identify a problem. Uh, you will see roof rat droppings with unexperienced technicians being mistaken for bat guana. If you'll take the dropping with a gloved hand, of course, and and roll the dropping, bat guana tends to fall apart and tends to have insect parts in it. Um, roof rat droppings will, are, are much more consistent. Uh, they do definitely have the pointy ends. You won't see the white flecks in them that you see with reptiles. Um, so they're, they're pretty easy to distinguish. It's just training your eye to, to note the differences. So this is a very interesting uh, map that was put together by our friends at MPMA and at Orkin. 
And what they did was take service tickets to find areas where identified services were done for roof rats. And as you can see, this map was done in 2005 and roof rats were predominantly found in the Southeast over through Texas. Um, and I can, I can attest there are quite a number of roof rats in Texas in 2005, uh, Louisiana, all of those areas, then also up the West coast, um, lots of roof rat population. If you take a look at a more recent study, you can see what's happening with a roof rat population. And if you look at these maps closely, um, you can see that the populations are much heavier in the South, but you can also, you can follow the Mississippi river and you see that it's dispersing, um, a population of roof rats. And you can also look at Chicago at the south of Lake Michigan and up into Wisconsin where shipping channels and shipping into the Great Lakes has increased rodent populations. You even notice those areas out in the, you know, Colorado areas there are massive rail yards out there where products are shipped and then trucked over the Rocky Mountains. So just short of the Rocky Mountains, you have all these warehouses where product is stored. And those warehouses are seeing a rodent population. So roof rats are moving and, and they're moving uh, from every direction and closing in across the country. So whereas in, in years past, people would just, people in the pest industry would just say, you know, we don't have roof rats. Um, that may be the case, but you will have them soon. And that's a positive thing from a business standpoint, but it may be a negative thing from a, from a learning curve. It's going to take some time for people to catch up and learn what they need to know about roof rats to help control them. Because the interesting part of it is you don't service them the same way. Um, I love this quote, the odds of hitting your target go up dramatically when you aim at it. Um, that's exactly the issue when it comes to roof rats and Norway rats. When we look at a Norway rat, your eyes need to be down. They're ground dwellers. You can put your bait stations in very traditional placements up against a building. There you see an, an Aegis RP anchor uh, up against a, a standard foundation wall. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the passageway and the hole go towards the wall itself and you know, you're, you're basically building a convenience store on the path that the rodent is taking. Uh, if you're looking at burrows, uh, you want to seriously consider burrow baiting with Norway rats. Um, if you look at the label on any blocked product, it's going to say that it's not used for underground use. But every major manufacturer makes up a, a pelletized or grain product that can be used in situations where you don't just want to dump a block um, for reasons of secondary poisoning or non-target poisoning. Um, so you do have the option of pelletized bait or grain bait. Uh, you may want to use the option of drain baiting. Um, I know we have a bait that is labeled for drain baiting. It's hung in bait and drains. Um, we use this extensively in Louisiana, New Orleans area, where this bait products can be hung in 
right above the water level and help control our rodent populations that are infesting those pipes. Even when you look at traditional traps and glue boards, um, you can use those placements against walls uh, where those rodents are running. Uh, you know, one of the big things you still see is to place the trap trigger toward the wall. Uh, turn the glue board where a rodent can't jump over it. Uh, but you can use those traditional placements. You don't have to get it extremely creative. Uh, we are also offering a, uh, a cylinderized CO2 product uh, now. It's, <clears throat> it's gaining EPA approval uh, in different areas of the country. And this, this product's allowing us to uh, inject CO2 into burrows directly. Uh, there's no run out, there's no noise, and there's no restrictions from PPE or or being up next to structures. So this is working extremely well with rodent populations, and it is labeled. Um, any product that's used in pest control where money is ex being exchanged has to be labeled by the EPA. So when we look at a roof rat, that's where your eyes go up. Um, you take a look at this roof on this home. There's all these breaks and all these different roof lines and, and all these, these uh, areas where the overhangs come back into the roof line. Those are all very real areas where a roof rat can come into a structure around the chimneys, around the, the uh, sewer uh, vent pipes, but also on commercial roofs. Uh, this just happens to be a picture of a brand new commercial roof, but all around those blue edges where the, where the roof line is attached to the parapet wall, any of those areas can be, can be easily broken through and gnawed through and be the access for a roof rat. Uh, many times on a flat roof like this, you may have to install bait stations. Uh, you can't just throw bait out because of birds and squirrels, and raccoons and other things, but you can put bait stations on a roof. This is a blow up of that earlier picture where we, um, where two roof lines come together. That gap's probably a good five eighths of an inch. Uh, just happened in a season. And, and when construction is done, <clears throat> if it's not running water, if it's not leaking, uh, construction tends to call things good. Well, in this situation, that's it's not, you know, no water can get in the structure. But what can happen is, is a rodent can sense the temperature difference and use that as an access. <clears throat> We've all been in an attic space. We've all crawled attic spaces and and this is very much an access for roof rats. Very much an area where roof rats like to live. They will run through this insulation. They will stay in this warmer area and they'll access food sources as they need it. They can live off of squirrel hordes. Uh, they can live off of bird nests and other items. This is that same tree that I showed earlier. Uh, customer uh, will not have this tree trimmed in any way, shape, or form. Uh, loves this tree. And so it's it's an opportunity when you're dealing with a customer who, who has this quality of life choice um, that you, you know, you need to look at rodent service for them as a preventative. Because there are some research out there that says approximately 50% of roof rats never touch the floor or the ground. If you're kicking a bait station up against a wall and calling it rodent service, 
there's approximately 50% of roof rats that you may possibly never have access to. Same research says 90% of a roof rat spends their time above four feet high. Look around the room that you're in right now. Find a doorknob. That's about 42 inches off the floor. So look a little higher than that. And that's that line at four feet. All of your service has to be concentrated in a roof rat situation above that line. You certainly want to look at every customer's home for uh, overhanging trees and power lines where, <clears throat> where rodents can get access to that home and bridge access to that home uh, when, you're, when you're setting up a perimeter. With roof rats, you have to be creative. Uh, this is an Aegis bait station. Uh, they work in an upright position. Um, they can also have a snap trap in them in an upright position. And this one's uh, actually zip tied to a two inch conduit just for a uh, situation of being able to catch a rodent on the run. You may have to put the, your traps in a unique location. Um, often wires, zip ties, and screws can be just as important as any other tool in your truck when you're dealing with roof rats. Um, you've got to be able to get creative. <clears throat> There's a picture of that snap trap. That's a Victor snap trap, but it slides right on the upright rods of that bait station, um, which can be used vertically or horizontally to allow you some creativity. We've all been in these office environments where um, it's, it's beautiful and clean, and then you get above the ceiling tiles. Uh, rodents will run these areas. Roof rats especially will run these areas like crazy. And you either have to trap. I'm, I am not against interior baiting. Um, <clears throat> I think it has to be done judiciously and carefully. Um, but it, whether you uh, use snap traps, glue traps, multi-catch traps, uh, you, with, especially with roof rats, you've got to address that suspended ceiling area because that is that's a free way for them. <clears throat> there are many things that these two types of rats have in common. Uh, they both will always have an available food source. If you know what they're eating, that gives you information. If you have information, you at least know where one end of their trip is. You know they're moving to that food source. So that helps you. Uh, find their path, find their droppings, and work your way back to their nest. Uh, even if you can't find their nest, it gives you a place to put your devices, uh, to put your bait stations, to put your bait, to put your snap traps, to put your glue boards. It gives you information. Uh, both of these rodents are nocturnal. <clears throat> they tend to do most of their moving at night. I'm a huge fan of uh, trail cameras, especially in problem situations where you're not sure what a rodent is doing. Trail cameras can be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, day or night. <clears throat> Neither rodent sees very well, but they use their smell, their taste, and their vibrissae, those whiskers, um, that are on their face. They, they tend to use that for information. Each one of those vibrissae attaches to a nerve ending and we don't understand them completely. Uh, they do, they sense motion, they sense temperature change and they give tons of information to this rodent just as they're moving around. Other things that they have in common, both are not smart. 
Lots of people like to talk about how smart rodents are. I don't like the word smart. Um, they're survivors for sure. Um, their, their little brains are, are about the size of a pencil eraser. Um, they do what they do very well, but they do it very consistently as well. Um, they will do what they have to do to survive. They'll do what they have to do to proliferate. Um, but that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I think both of these rodents take a very professional inspection. Inspection's key to everything, um, especially with an IPM approach. Inspection dictates every action that you take. Um, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes pest control operators and, and professionals make is <clears throat> they leave the office with their mind reasonably made up what they're going to do when they get on the site. I think it is much wiser to take the equipment, to take options for equipment and do an inspection and go with the information that you see and that you hear from your customer. <clears throat> Once you do that inspection, you let that, that inspection navigate you to what you do. Uh, you create a map of that rat's movements. You take that food source, you take that nesting material, you take those droppings and you create this map of where they're moving. And then you build a you build a, a convenience store on this traveled route. That convenience store might be the bait of your trap, or it might be the 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 bait that you're using in a bait station. But that's how you you control these roads. You know, don't forget rub marks. Don't forget damage that they're doing. Um, as you place them along this trail, you can get very solid control over a road. Uh, these are many of the products that Leafatech offers within the market. Um, we're always happy to help in any way, shape, or form if you have any rodent issues. One of the things Leafatech prides itself on is that we have over 130 years of field experience uh, within our than our management team. So we're more than happy to, to do site visits and visit with you and do anything we can to help on your rodent projects. Uh, I want to put my contact information back up again. If I can do anything to help anyone, I'm more than happy to, uh, we, any education that I can give any trainings that I can do for your staffs in any way, shape or form, we're here for you. And I appreciate your time today and thank Heritage for allowing me the opportunity to come.